camera action. Hi, my name is Kyle Anderson. I work with the City of Mason Fire Department. This is my partner here, Doug Woolard, and this is our mannequin Phil. And we're allowed to be on camera together. I know the coronavirus, we're supposed to be socially distancing, but you know, Doug and I share a bunk room, so it just makes sense that they they'd ask us to do this together. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through um, providing wellness CPR, hands-only CPR. And as you guys are coming back into the city and you're coming back from home, uh, you know, we just want to welcome you back and want to make sure as we're coming back and we're worried about staying healthy, safe, and well here in the city, we have you coming back and learning CPR and feeling like you can really take care of one another. So as we're going through this, uh, you know, maybe some of you might even be watching this video at home. So if you need a mannequin and you don't have Phil with you, grab your husband, grab your wife, your kids, you know, those people you haven't found a, a whole lot of use for lately. Go ahead and grab them, have them laying down in front of you, and then we'll just use them. We'll put them to work. Yeah, just don't push really, really hard. This. Yeah, just don't push really, really hard, okay? So as we, as we are talking about doing CPR, the first thing we need to be talking about is scene safety. And scene safety, you know, 10 years ago, we used to say things like, you know, don't do CPR in the middle of I-75. You know, if somebody's shooting at you, just wait till he's done and you can do all the CPR that you want. But nowadays, when we're talking about doing CPR, and we're talking about being safe, what I want you guys to be thinking about is, you know, the drug exposure. You know, heroin, carfentanil, all those kinds of things. The concern about heroin, carfentanil, and these drug exposures is a lot of them are now being snorted. Not a lot is being given um, via IV. So as we come up and we're doing CPR, the thing to keep in mind is, you know, we want to keep our mouths far from the patients we can. So if I were to grab this mannequin here really quick, and we do CPR like we used to, where we used to teach you to do this nice look, listen, and feel number. And when I would push down on the mannequin, you know, you can actually hear your mannequin if you're here in the city building. You can actually hear it exhale on you. So we want to avoid all of that together. So if we do hands-only CPR, not only is it more effective, but it actually reduces your chance of becoming exposed to those drug issues. So as we talk about that, we need to be talking about when to give CPR. So the first thing you need to do, you make sure the scene was safe. You know, nothing hinky seems to be happening. So you come up and you start assessing your patient, which you'll see Doug do. So you come up, say, hey, sir, can you hear me? Are you and if okay? you don't hear anything, hey, hey, are you okay? if you don't have him respond to you, and if I just place my hand in the center of the chest and I don't feel a heartbeat, I don't feel them breathing, just go ahead and start CPR. And we're talking about starting CPR. We want to make sure we do it mid-sternal, just in the center of the chest, and then between the nipple line. We want to be pressing at least two inches at a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. You know, a lot of people say that you can... Uh, uh, well, Doug, what's that song? We always oh, say, the, uh, stay alive. Alive. you know, you can do sing Staying Alive, and if you don't like your patient, or you don't like your husband or all that Justin well, Bieber. yeah, Justin Bieber, if you don't like your husband all the well, you know, what I like to do is another one bites the dust, that's a good Ooh, one a too, good one. you can sing that to yourself. So as we start doing it, you're going to start seeing Doug doing CPR. The first thing we see a lot of people do is we start to see them push with their arms and kind of treat it as an upper body exercise. That's a no-go. And when we do that, like Doug said, it's a no-go. Because if we start doing CPR, and we'll have Doug show you what that looks like, if he starts pressing with his arms, he can't do CPR for very long. You know, and what we need you to do is start CPR for us to come. So, you know, that may be we're sitting here at the fire department or we could be at the hospital coming back in. So you can be doing CPR for a while before we get there. So what we really want to be doing is locking out our arms, bending out our waist, and really how you stack your hands don't matter. You can interlace your fingers, you can stack your hands, you can cup your wrist if that feels more comfortable to you, and you use your whole body weight to press down on the center of the chest. This allows you to get deeper compressions and it makes sure you can perfuse the whole body. Okay, so as we do that, the most important part of that is, since we're using our body weight, the tendency we have is if we start to get tired, and Doug will show you, if you start to get tired, you can kind of ride your patient. And you can see Doug's kind of supporting his body weight into the patient as he's doing CPR. If we don't let that chest fully recoil, we're not allowing the heart to fill back up. If you imagine one of those kids' toys where you take it, you squeeze it underneath the water, and then you can squirt somebody with it after you do that, if we don't allow that heart, that heart to squeeze flat and expand back up, the heart doesn't get all that blood flow back to it. 
So Doug is making sure that he is allowing that complete chest breathing for it. Something to add, you might be wondering, well, if I'm not doing breaths, is CPR really as effective? The reality of it is, and I'm kind of talking Doug and I out of a job here, is that the breathing component statistically doesn't actually improve anybody's survivability chance. The only two things that we know that improve survivability is early CPR, which means before 911 gets there, and using an AED. How many, what's the minutes on this? What's the minutes on this? Oh, yeah, Doug is tired. I'm telling you, is it, it it's starts two minutes, to work, right? yeah. So two minutes. We'll, two two minutes. minutes. So yeah. every two minutes, we want to make sure we change rest course. Now the next component of this is the AED. And before we even talk about the AED, this is a good chance for you to be thinking about where in the city are our AEDs. The fire department and the assisting, you have assist, people assisting us maintain these in all the buildings throughout the city. And we make sure that they are fully charged. We make sure you have adult and pediatric pads. So this is a good chance for you to be thinking about where is that AED? Or where is that stop the bleed kit? Or where is a first aid kit that's local to me just in case I need it? So when we're talking about using the AED, what we need to be thinking about is a few different things. As we open up our AED, you always find your two adult pads. Sometimes they come in a package already, or sometimes they're loose out of the package. And we want to make sure that we put the AED pads where they need to go. If you look at the sticker, the top pad always goes to the top part of the chest. And the side pad, that bottom pad, always goes to the bottom. What we can't do is flop those in position. So the top always stays on the top, the bottom always stays on the bottom. And like all AED pads, you'll actually have to plug them back into your monitor. The things to know about your AED is Doug is getting this set up. The first thing we want to do when the AED shows up is turn it on because these AEDs take a few minutes to get started and get going. So Doug has attached the AED pads, he's turned on his AED, and he's ready to use it. A couple things about this AED is I can use the AED in rain, I can use it in a six foot snow drift, I can use it in a puddle. But what I can't use it is when the body's submerged. Because if the pads are submerged underwater, the electricity will go top the cross of the water and it could cause a risk to you. So like I said, rain, snow, but if you're, let's say at Kings Island in the kids section and you have that kind of shallow pool, we want to make sure you're pulling those kids out, getting their chest nice and dry, and making sure that the, um, the pads are connected. Safe, get a safe environment. It's, yep, and you've got to maintain that safe environment. In the city ADs, we also have included a razor for you. So if you have somebody that has a hairy chest, make sure we shave down that chest, get it nice and shaved down for you and uh, place those pads, okay? We can use adult pads on a child and we can use child pads on an adult. So if you come up to an AED either in the city or outside the city and you don't have the right pads, don't worry. We can still use those no matter what your patient type is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk you through a actual scenario. We're gonna imagine that we're in the community center, one of the patrons has gone unresponsive and you just happen to walk by and see a man down on the ground. So what I'm going to do is have Doug demonstrate that. So Doug, you're walking through the community center, you see a guy down on the ground, and we uh, go over to assess him, and we're going to have Doug just demonstrate what that looks like for you. So he's going to get a station set up, and again, this is another reason, you know, even if you're a city employee, and let's say you're outside of your department, you know, for the fire department, we're going everywhere. So not only is it important to know where the AEDs are for your building, but the more AEDs you know, the better it is for all of us. So if Doug's going to walk up, he sees somebody by the rowing machine, he's down and unresponsive, and we're going to watch what Doug does. As he does it, I'm going to talk to you about it. Hey, are you okay? He made sure his scene was safe, okay? and now he's checking responsiveness. Can you hear me? The guy hey, doesn't respond somebody to Somebody give him. me some help here. This guy's unresponsive. So Doug is telling us to get help, to call 911, and to grab an AED. I need an AED. Who knows where the AED is? So now somebody's on the way to get an AED. Thank you very much for the AED. Yeah. So the first thing we want to do is we always want to turn the AED on first, okay? And let the AED cycle through. We've got to make sure that the pads are connected. 
And once he has the pads on, he's going to go immediately to CPR. So you'll see him, he locked out his arms, he put them in the right place, and he's going to compress. Now we used to teach you CPR was 30 to 2. So we do 30 compressions to 2 breaths. So reality is now CPR in this scenario, because we're not doing the breathing component, we do CPR now until the fire department arrives. If you have somebody that is a bystander that can assist you, they can help run the AED or they can help hold the airway open. This is as simple as CPR is. There's no more steps you need to do. As long as you have the AED hooked up and you're using it and listening to the prompts and we're doing good CPR, that's all there is to doing this. If for some reason you hook up your AED, and you feel like your AD isn't talking, or, or maybe it says no shock advice, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It just means your AD is trying to find the exact right heart rhythm to be able to shock them into a good rhythm. We have seen patrons who weren't even trained in CPR revive people in the community center, and they were up and talking to us before we arrived. It's awesome. I think we see it. I think Doug saved him. Nice. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for doing this wellness CPR. You know, we want you guys to be safe and healthy as you're coming back from the coronavirus. And we really hope that you like this video. We hope to continue these videos. In our next video, we're actually going to have Lieutenant Roth break down the Stop the Bleed campaign. As you probably have seen in a lot of the city AEDs, you're starting to see extra equipment going to the AED cabinet. We don't want you to think of the AED cabinet as just a place to grab the AED. It is your resource for all kinds of first aid equipment, life-saving hemorrhage control equipment as well. So thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Phil. It's my pleasure. And welcome back to the City of Mason.